some version of this picture before. So this depicts what we know about BQP as it relates to the two most important uh, complexity classes in classical complexity theory, namely P and NP. Uh, so for example, we generally believe that BQP is more powerful than uh, classical polynomial time because of uh, problems like factoring and discrete logarithm. But nevertheless, we generally believe that BQP falls short of solving the hardest problems in NP, uh, namely the NP complete problems. Uh, and we can say a little bit more about BQP. So for example, um, we know that BQP contains BPP, which is bounded error probabilistic polynomial time, and which is basically uh, classical computations with the ability to toss coins. Uh, we also know BQP is contained in QMA, or quantum Merlin-Arthur, which is basically a uh, you can think of it as like a quantum analog of NP. Uh, but otherwise, it's actually extremely difficult to say anything interesting about how BQP uh, compares to complexity classes that we care about for non-quantum reasons. So for example, we don't know um, whether BQP is contained in, this, uh, in the polynomial hierarchy, which is like a generalization of NP. And um, th this has been extremely frustrating for those of us who work in uh, quantum complexity theory, because by contrast, if you look at BQP's classical cousin, BPP, uh, we can say so much more. Uh, and you know, here's just a short list. I'm not going to go through all of these, but you know, some highlights of uh, things we know how to prove are Edelman's theorem, which is that BPP is contained in P with polynomial size advice, or the sipser lodeman theorem, that BPP is contained in the polynomial hierarchy. Um, and, uh, and these are two practically ancient theorems <laughs> you know, uh, nowadays uh, compared to quantum complexity theory. And, um, in each one of these cases, if we replace BPP by BQP, then instead of being a theorem we can prove, uh, these all turn into open problems. Um, and this is sort of finally starting to get at the heart of the question that we ask in this work, which is basically, why can we prove all of these nice things about BPP? Why is classical computation somehow uh, much more nicely behaved compared to quantum computation? And I would say that, at least intuitively speaking, um, maybe the key feature of classical randomized algorithms that all of these theorems uh, kind of exploit is that uh, any time you have a classical algorithm that tosses coins, you can always um, sort of pull out those internal coin tosses and view it instead as just a deterministic algorithm that receives um, uh, a bunch of coins at the start of the computation as an auxiliary input uh, and that otherwise has no further randomness in its definition. By contrast, for quantum computation, uh, randomness seems to sort of inherently be something that appears at the end of the computation when amplitudes are turned into probabilities via the Born rule. And there does, uh, there does not appear to be any way that you can uh, pull the randomness or quantumness out of a quantum algorithm like we can for classical algorithms. Uh, but still, you should be left wondering how we can make this vigorous, right? Um, is there any sense in which we can actually prove that you can't pull the randomness out of a quantum algorithm like you can for classical algorithms? Well, uh, one tool that's been absolutely indispensable for uh, those of us who work in complexity theory has been uh, something called oracles, which is also known as um, relativized complexity or black box complexity or query complexity. And the idea is you consider some complexity class like BPP, and you consider what happens when you augment it uh, with this oracle O. And what that means is that uh, you get access to this black box where in a single time step, you can feed in an input X and you get back an answer O of X. And what we can ask is how many queries you need to make to this black box in order to decide some interesting property of this. And of course, what makes this model interesting in the quantum setting is that we don't just get to make queries one at a time, but we actually can um, feed in a superposition of inputs by defining this oracle as a unitary transformation. And so we can, um, oftentimes what we try to do is basically prove that you can solve something uh, using a small number of queries via a quantum algorithm, but not via a small number of queries um, with any classical algorithm. Um, and you know, just to give a, a few examples of, of where these show up, so uh, if we look at what are maybe the, the three most important questions in quantum complexity theory, uh, in each one of these cases, we can at least say something interesting about them uh, in this black box model. Uh, so for example, one is, um, can quantum computers be efficiently simulated by classical computers? Or in other words, is BQP equal to, P, uh, to BPP? Two, can quantum computers efficiently solve NP complete problems? Or in other words, is NP contained in BQP? Uh, and three, what is basically the, uh, what's the best classical upper bound on BQP? And in particular, is BQP contained on the polynomial hierarchy? 
Uh, in each of these cases, we at least have some evidence in the form of a, an oracle separation that you know, provides a, a negative answer to these questions. So for example, uh, if we look at uh, actually the very first paper in which uh, BQP was first defined by Bernstein and Vazirani, uh, they gave actually the first example of an oracle relative to which uh, BQP is strictly stronger than BPP. Uh, and in some sense, this was even uh, kind of the first evidence of any kind we had that quantum computers can actually do something that classical computers can't. Um, good, so that's most of the background. Before I move on, I do just want to point out one thing you might notice about these results, which is that uh, there is a more than 20 year gap between these first two results, which were proved very early on in the history of quantum complexity theory, uh, and this third result by Rosenthal in 2018. Um, and this is no coincidence. Uh, this, is, this was a notorious open problem of whether BQP is contained in the polynomial hierarchy relative to all oracles. And um, it's not a coincidence in the sense that um, our work uh, really relies on this, uh, this last result in many ways, both in the analysis they use to prove this, um, but also actually it turns out that many of our results uh, kind of uh, require an oracle relative to which BQP is not contained in PH as a formal prerequisite. So uh, I'll talk a little bit more about how we use that later, um, but I guess moving on, I'm gonna start talking about what we prove in this work. And if I had to summarize this in one slide, I would basically say that uh, sort of underscoring this fundamental difference between uh, quantum algorithms and classical algorithms, where it seems we can pull the randomness out in the classical setting, but not in the quantum setting, uh, we can show that in this uh, relativized or black box world, we can sort of uh, completely uh, unshackle BQP from classical complexity classes around it, in the sense that we can prove things that hold for quantum computation uh, that do not hold for classical computation. So uh, what are some examples of this? So uh, here's just like a short listing of some of the things we prove. And uh, on the right, you'll see um, a list of results about BPP that are kind of uh, either for folklore or well-known theorems um, and that hold relative to all oracles. Whereas on the left, we have sort of corresponding results where uh, if you replace BPP by BQP, then we can sort of directly contradict this relative to some oracle. And uh, if you're a complexity theorist, I probably don't even need to explain to you why many of these results are interesting uh, and even surprising. But uh, I think for everyone else, instead of uh, going through all of these, I think it will be more valuable for me to just kind of home in on one of these um, and really try to explain its significance. Uh, and specifically, we're gonna look at this first result, an oracle relative to which NP to the BQP is not contained in BQP to the NP. And um, the significance for this result has to do with this uh, well-known fact in classical complexity theory, which is actually sometimes given as like an exercise in uh, undergraduate complexity classes, which is that uh, if NP is contained in BPP, then in fact the entire polynomial hierarchy is contained in BPP. Uh, and there's actually essentially a, a nice short one-line proof of this, uh, which I've kind of summarized here. And uh, basically the key step in this proof involves showing this uh, highlighted containment that NP to the BPP is contained in BPP to the NP. Uh, and what this says is that if you have an NP algorithm, a non-deterministic algorithm that uses a randomized subroutine, then you can always, without loss of generality, uh, kind of pull the randomness out, choose the randomness before you choose the non-determinism, uh, non and instead consider a BPP to the NP algorithm. So you, you basically reverse the order of the randomness and the non-determinism. And um, what Lance Fortnow observed in 2005 is that exactly the same proof would work for BQP uh, to show that NP in BQP implies PH in BQP if you could show this one special containment that NP to the BQP is contained in BQP to the NP, or in other words, that you can pull the quantumness out of an NP algorithm. And so our result um, actually resolves an open problem that he had, um, and it basically shows that you cannot uh, um, pull the quantumness out of an NP algorithm like you can pull the randomness out. Um, so I think that's basically everything I wanted to say about the results. Um, hopefully you can take my word for it that all of our other results have a very similar flavor in the sense that we start with something classical, uh, a well-known result in classical complexity theory. We try to extend it to the quantum setting and then we exhibit an oracle that sort of suggests uh, or at least proves that you can't do this in this black box setting. And uh, in my remaining time, my plan is to 
talk just a little bit about um, some of the key ideas that go into proving these. So I won't talk too much about the proofs, but I can at least say, you know, what are the, um, especially some of the things we prove that might even be independently interesting. And um, as I kind of alluded to before, uh, perhaps the single most uh, important tool that goes into proving our results is this problem called the correlation problem, which was introduced by Scott Aronson in 2009. And it is the following task. So you're, you're given um, Oracle access to a pair of Boolean functions, f and g. Uh, and you must decide whether f and g are independent and uniformly random functions, or whether f and g are individually uniformly random, but f is sort of non-negligibly correlated with the Boolean Fourier transform of g, in which case we say that f and g are correlated. And in the paper in which this was defined, Aronson showed that this problem can be solved in BQP. And in fact, actually, depending on how you define this problem, you can even solve this using only a single query to f and g on a quantum device. Uh, and he left it as an open problem to show that this problem is not in the polynomial hierarchy. And this was finally resolved um, almost a decade later by Van Vaz and Avi Shaital, where they showed that, uh, as I said, correlation is not contained in pH relative, um, relative to this oracle. And this actually gave the first example of an oracle relative to which uh, pH is not in BQP, resolving, uh, or sorry, relative to which BQP is not in pH, uh, resolving this long-standing open problem. Uh, so sort of the key way in which we use correlation uh, is conceptually as a kind of encryption against classical algorithms. So what do I mean by this? So the idea is that you have uh, some string of zeros and ones, and you consider uh, turning these into a list of corresponding correlation instances, where, say, if you have a zero, you would choose a uniformly random instance. And if you have a one, you might choose a correlated instance. And by doing this, you make these bits accessible to a quantum algorithm, because a quantum algorithm can run this algorithm for the, for the correlation problem and distinguish the uniform and correlated bits. But you basically make this information uh, inaccessible to classical algorithms, or indeed, even pH algorithms, uh, because, by Ross and Tall, uh, this four-layer distribution is, uh, um, is indistinguishable by pH algorithms from the uniform distribution. Uh, and sort of this, this is sort of one of the key tools that we use in constructing these oracles to, uh, for instance, put really big complexity classes inside of BQP while keeping them separate from classical complexity classes. Um, OK, good. So uh, another interesting technique that goes into some of our results is um, a well-known technique in classical complexity theory. Uh, specifically, this comes from uh, usually proving circuit lower bounds, and this is something called random restrictions. And the idea is that you have some function f, and you consider what happens to f when you fix most of the inputs to this function. So you'll set most of the bits to be either zeros or ones, and then you'll just look at the unrestricted bits uh, and consider the, the function, which we usually denote by f sub rho, uh, obtained by uh, just looking at those remaining bits. Uh, and usually what you try to show is that um, under such a random restriction, with high probability, this function simplifies greatly. Uh, so perhaps the most famous example of a random restriction lemma is something known as Hostad switching lemma, uh, which says that if f is computable by a, a low-depth classical circuit, then this restricted function with high probability uh, can be computed by a low-depth decision tree or a classical query algorithm. And what we prove is something that's uh, conceptually very similar, but just for quantum algorithms instead of AC0 circuits. We show that if you start with a, a function that is computed by a low query quantum algorithm and you fix most of its inputs, then with high probability, this restricted function um, is also, uh, well, uh, not necessarily exactly equal to a, a low depth decision tree, but it's actually close to a low depth decision tree. Uh, and again, it basically shows that um, this these kinds of functions simplify greatly under restriction. Um, finally, I'll mention just one more uh, interesting um, structural property of quantum algorithms that we prove, uh, and that's important to one of our results. Uh, and it says the following. Uh, suppose you have a quantum algorithm Q that makes T queries. Then there exists a classical algorithm that makes uh, only polynomially many more queries, so something like T to the power of five, and that approximates the acceptance probability of Q on a large fraction of all sufficiently sparse inputs X. And here, by a sufficiently sparse input, I mean, uh, if you think of it as being divided into these blocks, uh, then each block is almost entirely zeros, and it contains just a single one in a uniformly random location. And 
Uh, what's interesting about this is that this bears very close resemblance to um, a well-known result in, uh, or sorry, a well-known conjecture, <laughs> I should say, in quantum query complexity, uh, sometimes called the Aronson and Bionis conjecture, which states that, or which conjectures that something very similar holds uh, for quantum query algorithms, except instead of considering this uh, uniformly random distribution over inputs, uh, or sorry, instead of considering this uh, sparse distribution of inputs, you consider a uniformly random in, uh, input. So it says that there's basically a, a classical algorithm that approximates the acceptance probability on a large fraction of uniformly random inputs. And so our result is interesting because it's sort of, um, at least to my knowledge, maybe the first uh, interesting version of this theorem that we can prove just for a different distribution. And I guess depending on how optimistic you are, this might even be like a, um, like a stepping stone towards proving this full Aronson and Bionis conjecture. Um, so that's everything I wanted to say about the proof techniques. I'm just going to wrap up with saying a little bit about some of the open problems we have. And um, roughly speaking, these can be divided into two categories. Um, the first two are kind of more uh, qualitative improvements, so proving stronger oracle separations. And the last two are more quantitative improvements. Uh, so for this first result, this um, uh, is act would actually be a strengthening of the result I mentioned. Um, where NP to the BQP is not contained in BQP to the NP relative to an oracle. So the question is basically, can we extend this to an oracle relative to which, in fact, NP is contained in BQP, but the polynomial hierarchy is not contained in BQP? Uh, similarly, it would be interesting to get oracles where, um, well, we can sort of do crazy things like make BQP equal to X, but not equal to other classical complexity classes. Uh, so currently we prove something that's conceptually very similar, so we can give an oracle relative to which P equals NP uh, and is not equal to BQP, which equals P to the sharp P. And it would be interesting to know if you could make that P to the sharp P into something even stronger like EXP. And then finally, there's just a couple of open questions about um, whether we, we can uh, quantitatively improve some of these, um, these structural properties of quantum algorithms that I mentioned. So um, in particular, is there a faster algorithm for uh, the approximating the acceptance probability of uh, uh, quantum query algorithms on sparse inputs. So as I mentioned, we have like a t to the five, where t is the number of queries uh, simulation. And we don't really have any reason to believe that that is optimal. Um, you could perhaps even get it all the way down to something like t squared. Uh, and then again, some kind of similar for our random restriction lemma. Um, again, we kind of don't really have any reason to believe that our lemma is quali uh, sorry, quantitatively optimal. So it will be interesting to show um, sort of a stronger version of that that is actually quantitatively more similar to the random restriction lemmas we can prove, say, for AC zero circuits. Uh, and with that, I think that's everything I want to say, so I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, if anyone has any questions, please come up to the mic here. Maybe I'll uh, ask one while people are kind of formulating their questions. Um, so uh, it, it sounds like, um, in some sense, the like you, you said you can sort of fix the randomness or the non-determinism in any order. It doesn't matter um, in the classical case. Uh, um, well, like, what do you mean? So we can. I mean, I view it more as like pulling the randomness out. But I guess, yeah, okay, yeah. We're basically saying you can sort of fix the randomness in advance of the non-determinism in this NP to the BPP algorithm. Uh, and okay, in order to do this, you have to like uh, amplify the success probability enough, but this is sort of a, a straightforward technique, yeah. And then it's, it's not the case that you could sort of like, you know, fix the, the quantumness and the, uh, and the classical non-determinism don't well, like commute in the right. same yeah, way. Right, yeah, somehow they, they don't commute, exactly. <laughs> but yeah. what about um, like if, you know, uh, you go to sort of quantum non-determinism. So like, are analogs of these results where you replace NP with QMA um, super easy or also open? Um, let's see, so. I, w I think I'd have to think about that more. Um, I mean, we do have one result, this, this last result that, that concerns QMA. Um, it, it basically says, 
that if you add post selection to BQP, then it is not contained in what you might call the QMA hierarchy. And this has some interpretation as showing that there's sort of no quantum analog of Stockmeyer's algorithm, if you're familiar with that. Um, but actually, otherwise, yeah, I, I don't really know if uh, which of these results, if any, can be extended to say something interesting about QMA. Okay, so, thank, good thanks. Good question. Uh -huh. Okay, well, uh, at the end, your final open question was that can you improve the random restriction lemma? Mm -hmm. and do you think you have improvements in uh, the, the parameters of the random restriction, or the you know, at the end of the random restriction, you come up with a function that is simple in, in some sense, in the sense it's close to a decision tree. Are you also trying to think of uh, I, I guess it's actually kind of both. So, right, there's this one caveat that the restricted function is not exactly a decision tree, it's just close to a decision tree. Um, but the other thing is that uh, you have to restrict a much larger fraction of the inputs to get the behavior we want. So, um, for example, in like Hostad switching lemma, you leave alive something like n over polylog n um, variables, and that's enough. But in order for our thing to work, you leave alive something more like square root of n variables, which is much smaller. Um, but we don't have any reason to believe that that is optimal. And, and do you think you could get a switching lemma, but the final conclusion is still that you're a decision tree, not, not close to a decision tree, with the same assumptions? Um, I, I would honestly not commit to guessing one way or the other. <laughs> Okay. Thanks. Uh, hi, William. So you mentioned just a moment ago that this result about post-PQP and this QMA hierarchy says something about, uh, or is it some kind of no-go theorem about quantum analogs of uh, Stockmeyer approximate counting. Could you comment on what specific analog is being ruled out? Uh, yes, right. So th that's a very good point because there are many different ways in which you could formalize what it means to look at a quantum analog of Stockmeyer's algorithm. Uh, this particular one just means uh, trying to approximate within multiplicative error the acceptance probability of a quantum algorithm. Thanks. Um, by contrast, you know, this doesn't say anything about, say, like approximating the um, the number of witnesses accepted by like a QMA verify or something like that. This is this is different. Great, thanks. Time for one more uh, short question. Okay. Um, so the way that you define BPP is to say that um, you can pull the randomness first out of the circuit computation and then the rest is deterministic. So uh, isn't this an inherently non-black box operation that you're doing to the BPP? Uh, um, and how does this compare to BQP? So it, it depends what you mean by, okay, may, maybe in a certain sense you could say it's sort of non-black box, but it is black box in the sense that it is relativizing. So um, if you have this algorithm that queries an oracle, then you can turn it into this different algorithm that is deterministic, that receives all of its random coins at the start, and that queries the same oracle. Um, I don't know if that satisfies your question, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Right. And next we're going to hear from Rahul Jain, who's going to talk about uh, direct product theorem for communication complexity with applications to device independent QKD. Hi, okay, thanks, Tissy. Um, all right, uh, so uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be talking about uh, some direct product theorems in communication complexity with application to device independent QKD, and this is joint work with Sri Takundu. Okay, so what is a direct product uh, theorem, right? So um, we can consider, say, any model of computation, right? And, and, and the question is basically asking is uh, how much harder it is to compute n different independent instances of a task as, uh, uh, as compared to doing one instance. Okay, so let's say we just do the naive thing that we take an algorithm for one instance of the problem and just run it independently on each independent instance. Then firstly, our resource would, would scale n times, right? Whatever was needed for, for algorithm A. Uh, 